What I'm about to tell you might be so shocking, so unbelievable that I almost don't want to tell you at the start of this video, but I will. Is that LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, is not the most important biomarker when assessing metabolic health and in particular assessing the risk of having a heart attack. By the end of this video, you'll understand exactly why this is the case and also what is the biggest risk factor for heart attacks and the biggest risk factor of dying from a heart attack. So let's get to it. We all need cholesterol to survive because for one, it's an important component of cell membranes, but also because it's a precursor to steroid hormones. If you don't eat cholesterol, your body has to make it. Now you probably heard of HDLs being the good cholesterol. That's high density lipoprotein and LDL as being the bad cholesterol. Doctors pay attention to both of these, but when the LDL is too high, they're gonna tell you to eat less fat in your diet and also to take a statin medication. Let me know in the comments below if this is what your doctor tells you. And for many years has been thought of as being the most important biomarker to assessing the risk of having a future heart attack. Statins lower LDL levels, but do they decrease the risk of heart attack? And do they decrease the risk of dying from a heart attack? To answer that question, we have to look at how this all started in the first place. Cholesterol and LDLC in particular, emerged as a risk factor based on the Framingham Heart Study, a huge observational study in Massachusetts that started decades ago and continues to this day. The big takeaway was that if you had a very high LDLC, you were more likely to suffer a heart attack. But when the data was more carefully analyzed, what was realized was that LDLC was only a risk factor if it was very high, like over 190. Now, most people never have an LDL this high. And if you do, you probably have a genetic condition that's causing that. Now, people with LDLC levels less than 70, on the other hand, rarely have heart disease. But what about the majority of the population who fall between 70 and 90? In this context here, LDLC is not a great predictor of having a heart attack. While it's true that the hazard ratio of LDLC is 1.3, meaning if you have an elevated LDLC, there's an associated or correlated 30 percent increased risk of a heart attack correlation does not equal causation. When you remove younger people from the analysis and just look at people 60 and older and also remove the people that have genetic reasons for super high LDL levels, the LDL levels don't predict heart attacks. Let's say you get blood work done and your LDL level is 100. Okay, so you're right here on the scale. You're all but guaranteed to get a script for a statin medication which inhibits cholesterol synthesis. The current mindset in the medical establishment is to get the LDL down as low as possible by means of statin medications and sometimes other drugs and also eating a low fat diet. Well, despite governmental recommendations to eat low fat diets and despite statins being the most prescribed medications for the population as a whole, LDLC levels overall remain high. Now, some researchers and doctors will argue that fewer people are actually dying of heart attacks in high income countries like the United States. And this is true, but even though there's less people dying of heart attacks, more people are suffering them. Why? Because we're better at treating heart attacks, because we become faster at recognizing them with faster ambulance response times, and we're faster at getting patients that clot buster medication or getting that patient to the cath lab to get a stent put in. We also provide better care after someone has a heart attack. So even though the number of deaths from heart attack have gone down, the total number of heart attacks have gone up. And as the Accelerate trial showed us, lowering LDLC does not improve the risk of having a heart attack. And here's something that 99% of people don't know, including most doctors. The standard fasting lipid profile, the blood test that looks at your cholesterol numbers, assumes that all LDL particles are identical. There's actually two types of LDL, but that lipid profile test measures them together as one number. 80% of the LDL cholesterol that circulates in your bloodstream comes in the form of large buoyant LDL, also known as type A LDL. And this is the one that increases when eating more fat. It's also the LDL that decreases when taking a statin medication. The large buoyant LDL is cardiovascularly neutral, meaning it's not the LDL particle that causes plaque to accumulate in the arteries, which is what leads to a heart attack. So I think of this LDL as being nothing more than a big cuddly teddy bear. Now let's meet the true bad cholesterol, and his name is small dense LDL, also known as type B LDL. This bad boy cholesterol only makes up 20% of LDL particles. 
This is the LDL that goes up when people have metabolic syndrome from eating processed food, especially refined carbohydrates and sugar. This is the LDL that's causing that plaque to build up in the artery leading to a heart attack. But if you really want to predict your risk of a heart attack, you need to look at this type of LDL. Now this study and this analysis was particularly striking, which can be visualized with these graphs. This study showed that the risk of coronary heart disease depends on the small density LDL, not the large buoyant LDL levels. And the problem with statins is that they're going to lower your total LDL levels because they're mainly reducing the large buoyant LDLs and not so much the small dense. In fact, the Jupiter trial confirmed the heart disease risk associated with small LDL. Even in patients treated with a statin and who had an average LDLC of 54, which is very low, they still had a significant increase in risk for coronary heart disease and death. Now, over time, medical guidelines have continuously expanded the recommendation for the number of people that should get a statin medication. The argument goes like this. Statins are lifesavers and that people will die if they stop taking them. You even have big time researchers from prestigious academic institutions declaring that everyone over 50 should be on a statin in order to reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease. And there's no question they do lower LDLC. And if you have a genetic disorder that's causing your LDL to be through the roof, they're necessary. But outside of that group, are they reducing heart attacks? No. And I'm not even going to get into the potential side effects of these drugs. So why are the medical guidelines so adamant about pushing these statins onto the population? Well, for one, there's a lot of financial incentive with big pharma. Two, it wasn't until recently that we now know that it's the small LDL, not the total LDL, that predicts heart disease risk. And three, the data from these studies on statins initially looked way more promising than they really are. Kind of makes you go, hmm. For example, do you want to guess the increase of median life expectancy in those with heart disease thought to be the best candidates for statins over a five-year period? Yes, you heard that right. People who qualified for statins in these trials, they took statins and they postponed their deaths a whopping four days. <laughs> Now, what about other drugs that lower LDL numbers? Ezetimibe or Zetia reduces intestinal cholesterol absorption. Then you have drugs like Evolocumab, better known as Repatha, which is a PCSK9 antibody. It works by blocking an enzyme and it ends up allowing the liver to clear more LDL from the bloodstream. It was found that it reduces the number of heart attacks, reduces strokes, but so far, no mortality benefit. So we have medications that reduce LDL, but if it's not going to significantly reduce this LDL, you can't expect it to have significant health benefits, especially when it comes to reducing heart attacks and deaths from heart attacks. And this isn't surprising because the root cause of the problem is metabolic illness that stems from insulin resistance, which is caused by eating processed food. So this can only be fixed or improved by eating unprocessed food and to a certain extent, exercise. It's the small dense LDL that rises in response to eating refined carbohydrates, especially added sugar. And when most people cut out the fat, they usually are gonna replace it with refined carbohydrates and or simple sugars. And if you want more evidence that total LDL levels aren't the best biomarker for cardiovascular disease prevention or treatment, take a look at the Lyon Heart Study, where they looked at people eating a Mediterranean diet for secondary prevention of a heart attack. Secondary means after you've already had the first heart attack. The Mediterranean diet is mostly unprocessed food and it's not considered a low-fat diet. The results of this study were much more impressive compared to that of statins. And guess what? When you get that fasting lipid panel, this small dense LDL isn't the only dangerous particle that you have to look at. The other one is this guy, the triglyceride. The more of these guys you have, the higher likelihood of metabolic syndrome, fatty liver disease, and heart attack. The largest study of heart attacks in the United States revealed that two thirds of them had metabolic syndrome. In fact, when it comes to the risk of heart disease, having elevated total LDL levels isn't as bad as having elevated triglyceride levels. The hazard ratio for high LDL levels is 1.3 compared to the hazard ratio of high triglyceride levels of 1.8, meaning your risk is 80% higher with higher triglycerides compared to LDL. When you get blood work done and have that fasting lipid panel done, pay special attention to the triglyceride level. To understand why serum triglyceride levels are so important, we have to first understand its physiology or its biochemistry. Once that serum triglyceride unloads its fat at the adipocyte, the fat cell, 
it then turns into a small dense LDL. Therefore, that triglyceride to HDL ratio is the real ratio of bad to good cholesterol. It's the best biomarker of small dense LDL, which is the best biomarker of cardiovascular disease and the best indirect way of determining your degree of insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. If that triglyceride level is higher than 150, it's all but guaranteed that you're dealing with metabolic syndrome. So triglycerides, the most important thing to look at in the lipid panel, but then the second most important biomarker to look at in that lipid panel is the HDL, the high density lipoprotein. If it's higher than 60, that's great cardiovascular health. But if it's less than 40 in men or less than 50 in women, that's going to increase the risk of heart disease. And one more thing on this triglyceride to HDL ratio, for unknown reasons, race matters with this. If the ratio is over two and a half in Caucasians or over one and a half in African Americans, that is a correlate of metabolic syndrome. And what about that total LDL cholesterol? Well, if it's less than 70, the fraction of small dense LDL ends up being so low that it's highly unlikely to cause harm. Now, if it's over 300, which is super high, there's a high probability that you have a rare genetic disease like familial hypercholesterolemia in which you can't clear your LDL. Now, in this genetic condition, because you can't clear your LDL, you would need a low-fat diet and likely require a statin medication and, in some instances, even this medication here, Repatha, aka Evolocumab. So if you're in this range, like most people, let's say less than 190, but more than 70, well, you already know what to do. Take a look at those triglyceride levels, those HDL levels, and that triglyceride to HDL ratio. And just remember that high triglyceride levels and metabolic syndrome are a direct result of insulin resistance, which comes from eating too many refined carbohydrates and simple sugars. This is why adults shouldn't consume more than 25 grams of added sugar per day. And it's no wonder that treatments that reduce triglyceride levels also reduce the amount of small dense LDL. Research shows that exercise, running in particular, at least with this study, did exactly that. Now, other researchers show that diets loaded with simple carbohydrates have a direct correlation with levels of small LDL particles. Fish oil supplementation, which contains omega-3 fatty acids, have been shown to reduce triglyceride levels and small LDL as well. Why? Well, omega-3 fatty acids help to reduce inflammation, and inflammation contributes towards plaque formation. So small LDL particles, inflammation, trans fats, all three of these cause that plaque to form, and when that plaque ruptures, that's what causes the heart attack. So if you really want to minimize your risk of having a heart attack, it really comes down to what you eat, exercise, and of course, not smoking. So besides cutting out or reducing refined carbs and simple sugars, you also need to make sure you avoid eating those trans fats, which mostly come from fried foods, but can also come inadvertently when you overheat, meaning you go past the smoking point of certain unsaturated fats when you're cooking them. So for example, olive oil has a smoking point of about 350 to 375 degrees, and if you're cooking at temperatures above that, then that monounsaturated fat, which has a cis bond in it, that heat will turn that into a trans bond, and that is now a trans fat. When people eat too much highly processed food, their ratio of omega-6 fatty acid to omega-3 fatty acid is around 20 to 1, and ideally it'd be around 1 to 1, which is what happens when you eat mostly unprocessed food. Now, why is that important? If you're at 20 to 1 as opposed to 1 to 1, well, that's going to generate more inflammation in the body, and that's going to contribute towards that plaque formation. Now, what about saturated fat? Is it good? Is it bad? Well, spoiler alert, it depends. And if you want to know exactly the detailed answer on that, check out this video right here.